Good afternoon, Lung Pao. Good afternoon. Um, today is Saturday, June the 27th. Thank you for willing to answer our questions again, Kapo Pao. First question today is regarding separation from the loved ones. How should we prepare to for for inevitably separation from the loved one, especially our old aged parents? Well, this is. <clears throat> life experience, we all have to separate from what we love. And um, this is oftentimes not recognized, you know, we, we live in a world of our own thoughts and desires, hoping to find eternal happiness. And if we're thinking about that, the end of life is always the ultimate separation from the love. <clears throat> because it is when you love somebody or when you love life, then you don't want to be separated from her. But in mindfulness practices, we're aware of this, this feeling, you know, this sense of, of uh, separation, of division, of, of longing for someone or not wanting to die. Can all our mental states that we can be aware of, like preparing aging people for death? The many questions many people ask, you know, they have parents or grandparents who are very old and are going to die soon, and how to prepare them. <clears throat> Well, all, you know, speaking from experience, old people know they're going to die. It's very clear when you get old, you don't have that much longer to live. But uh, sometimes, you know, to be sensitive to the person involved, whether they're open to discussions about death or not, just to kind of blatantly bring up the subject uh, might be unwanted or a shock, but you know, you can be sensitive to the person involved about death because it is important. It's the ultimate experience of our life. And to see it as not as something unpleasant or unwanted, but a kind of release. As uh, the poet Shelley said, awakening from the dream of life. Because life itself is like a dream. And death is, 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 uh, can be an awakening reality rather than a, a kind of horrible ending to a life. Now this is trying to put into perspective just the, the natural processes that every human being has to endure in a, in a lifespan from birth, growing up, getting old, getting sick, separation from the love, death. These are all, in monastic life, we reflect on these all the time, every day, just to, to bring into consciousness the realities of our humanity. It's like this. There's nothing wrong with it. And when we think there's something wrong with somebody that dies, is is just because we we think that death is something bad, but it's not. It's a release from the conditions of the physical form. And, you know, see it as, as rest rather than as, as some kind of uh, unknown fear, something that, uh, you know, one can only be afraid of. and. And, and create into the possibilities after death what happens, what happens when somebody dies. But the Buddha pointed to the reality of the deathless, which is the conscious reality that we're all experiencing in this very moment. A consciousness 
doesn't isn't born and doesn't die, where what dies is the physical body, and what is constantly dying in our everyday experience are our thoughts, memories, emotions, arise and cease according to conditions. They are born, they die, they begin, they end. But and the physical body was born and will die. That's what it's supposed to do. So, you know, to see death as something kind of like a, the ultimate achievement of life is, uh, is awakening to the, the, the kind of rest that one can expect from, from the reality of death, physical death. And should, should we prepare ourselves for the our future, the death of our parents the same way? Yes, because that's what everybody has to learn from. When one parents grow old, get sick and die. And, you know, we do feel grief and we we don't want them to die or we, you know, we miss them. Things like mental states arise, but the mindfulness and wisdom practice is to, is to be aware of what you're feeling. If I say you shouldn't grieve, if you're really mindful, you won't grieve, then you'll feel guilty about grieving. But what I encourage you to do is when a parent dies or somebody you love, passes on uh, to be aware of the, the, the sense of loss. The, that which is aware of grief isn't grieving, and that's what mindfulness really is. It's the awareness, it's the knowing. It's like this, uh, where we do form opinions about if you're really mindful, you don't feel anything, but we can't help but feel this is a feeling realm, this realm of our human state, the physical body. We have eyes, ears, nose, tongue. We have retentive memory. We have emotions of pleasant, painful, happy, unhappy conditions that arise according to other conditions. But what doesn't change according to conditions, what is our real refuge is in the Dhamma, which is, in practical terms, consciousness here and now. Because experience is always here and now. You know, we, we believe in the reality of time. Time is, is our real world. But time is, you know, when you investigate time, you know, tomorrow is, is, the, is what you don't know. Yesterday is a memory. But there's a knowing, always in the present. And uh, when we don't take refuge in knowing, in mindfulness, then we tend to get caught in our emotions. We grasp hold of them and we become miserable and unhappy and, and carried away by our grief that we are naturally feeling. But with awareness, uh, you know, we're aware of grief or sense of loss is like this. It, it is what it is in the present. It's, it's conditioned. It's a phenomenon that is and it's changing. It doesn't have any permanent, permanent ability at all. So, you know, this, this way of reflecting, which is, you know, the cultivation of awareness in daily life helps us to deal with the problems that we do face in life, such as the aging of our parents, their, their sicknesses, their problems, and their final death is, you know, is part of a life experience. Not something that is bad, but just the way things are, that, that all that is born will die. If, so if we feel anxious thinking about our parents that will pass away or, or in the future, so we should we should 
be mindful of the anxiety that we feel too, right? Yes. Because that's what you know. If you if you if you feel anxious about your parents' uh, condition as they grow old, uh, you know you're aware of anxiety. Well, and, that, and that awareness of anxiety is is not grasping it. It's just knowing it's like this. Where when we grasp anxiety, then we become an anxious person. So you know you can't help but feel anxious. When you think of your parents, uh, you know, with their physical problems, their aging difficulties, and their eventual dying, uh, you know, those very thoughts create a sense of anxiety and fear because the future is the unknown. Uh, what happens when you die? Uh, you know, all these speculations, thoughts about the future, images that we create or denials that we grasp are, you know, created by us. They're, they're artifices, artificial conditions that we, we tend to grasp blindly and lose awareness of them because we're, we're, we're believing totally in that we are or I am this anxious person and that uh, I don't, you know, I may not want to be an anxious person, so how do I get rid of anxiety? And so you create, a, it becomes complicated. The more you claim it and see it as personal, as some kind of problem uh, that you want to get rid of, uh, it becomes more complicated, more convoluted, until you trust your awareness to be aware because you're always aware, you know, you're never not aware, but whether you're aware with wisdom or with ignorance. So attaching to the anxiety out of ignorance is suffering and letting go of anxiety and being aware of the feeling of anxiety, letting go of it is wisdom, is, is liberation from suffering. Thank you very much, Abhuha. Um, second question is regarding practicing loving kindness. So we should practice loving kindness towards oneself and to others and not harming oneself and to others. The um, practicing loving kindness and not harming others are easy to understand. Can you explain how, how we can cultivate loving kindness to ourselves, to oneself, and not harming oneself? Well, as I was saying before, it's loving kindness is, is ultimately awareness. You know, if you, you can create this, the words loving kindness, they're, they're sankharas. <laughs> And then you spread loving kindness to yourself. So that's the intellectual process. But the realities of loving kindness, of metta, is awareness. Being aware of what you're feeling, being aware of the body, being aware of, of the uh, thinking, the thinking habits you have, your emotions, and so forth is actually loving kindness because it's non-critical awareness doesn't criticize it's not saying it's not condemning judging making any comments about whether it's right or wrong good or bad it's a, it's like it, you you know we use the phrase it's like this so loving kindness is the is is an awareness are almost synonymous or can be completely synonymous when we say that by accepting the way we feel, not by letting go of it and, you know, re recognizing it's like this, meaning we're not trying to do anything with it, criticize it, saying we should or shouldn't feel this way, but we are accepting it as it is. And of course it changes, it, what begins must end. And, mental states are, you know, 
very impermanent. They change, uh, you know, quite regularly throughout the day and night. So, um, and that's how, how how do we put that towards ourselves with with that critical thinking mind that criticize ourselves all the time or put ourselves to do. Well, it's a habit that the, the thinking process is a critical. That's what it does. It criticizes. You know, so you've got heaven and hell, good and bad, right and wrong, true and false, and and then you you know we we when we look at life, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, what we think, we 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 evaluate it as good or bad, right or wrong, pleasant or unpleasant, acceptable or unacceptable, and so you know the tendency to criticize oneself becomes a habit and the more you 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 uh, you know the more you depend on the thinking process to create the world you live in uh, then you see everything wrong with the world the world is you know it shouldn't be the way it is it, it is so many things wars disease pandemics um, political problems social problems relationship problems there's nothing but problems and difficulties when we look at the world through the critical mind because, you know, we conceive perfection like a perfect relationship, a perfect society, uh, a perfect man, a perfect woman, uh, and, and then, but the, the thinking process is a way, you know, it tends to dwell on what's wrong with somebody, what's wrong with the, political system, what's wrong with a society, what's wrong with the relationship. And therefore, we become obsessed, you know, we, we see ourselves, you know, as we have ideals of perfection of what uh, one personally would like to be. And then you look at yourself, your critical mind will say, you, you shouldn't feel like this, you shouldn't be afraid, you should be brave. You should love people, you shouldn't be critical of them, you shouldn't hate, you shouldn't get angry, you shouldn't be greedy, you should, uh, you know, everything's equal and everybody's the same and we can see things in terms of ideals. And uh, the thinking mind can create ideals of perfection. Just take words to their superlative form and, uh, you know, the very best of everything, you can create an image of perfection. And then what we are experiencing through the changing conditions that we're living with, such as the physical body and the changing conditions of experience, of what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, uh, you know, these, these things can be perfect. Their very nature is is to change from beginning to end, you know. So, uh, you know, best you can expect from sankharas, from conditions, from from from, from phenomena, is occasional peak moments when when something that is at its best, but it can't stay there because its nature is to change. You know, every like inhalation, exhalation, you can't just inhale. You reach a peak where you can't inhale anymore, and that conditions the exhaling. So, sankharas are based on that pattern of arising, ceasing, and well, as human beings, because we have this reflective ability, this ability to intuit reality in the present moment, we're we're observing this this as we experience it. And that which is aware of change doesn't change. You know, so that's when we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. <clears throat> are they, you know, the words themselves are sankaras, but are they pointing to awareness, mindfulness, amatta dhamma, the reality of the death, deathless reality that, we're, that we are rather than what we think we are. 
So people, you know, perfectionists can always find fault. You can always feel guilty about the mistakes you made in life. You can always see things, you know, uh, in yourself that could be improved or shouldn't be or become obsessive and unpleasant. You'd like to get rid of them. But just by trying to perfect yourself as a personality, as a Sankara, it's impossible. You know, you can, you can make things better, you know, is the, is the most you can do. But to really understand life and existence, it takes awareness, this reflective Buddha mind, Buddha nature, that the Buddha pointed to and encouraged us to trust to take refuge in. So that is, you know, the way out of suffering, the, 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 even though uh, an enlightened human being still gets old, gets sick and dies, they don't, they don't escape the, the realities of the Sankaras, but their relationship to Sankara is knowing rather than grasping, ignorant grasping of Sankaras, trying to control, trying to annihilate, trying to change, trying to uh, get what you want all the time or, or believing in everything you're thinking and feeling as reality, you know, where if you trust your awareness, you, even if you're depressed, you can be aware. Depression, feeling down, life is meaningless, is like this. And as you trust this awareness, you know, then that never gets depressed, it never gets angry, it never gets greedy. It's perfect. You know, it's perfection itself. So it's, we call that the Amatta Dhamma. So this is the way out of suffering by understanding it, not by destroying suffering, but not grasping it because you know, if, if we don't want to grow old, we're going to be terribly upset when we find out how old we are. If we don't ever want to get sick, we just want to be healthy and vigorous forever, you know, we're, we're going to be terribly disappointed because that's, <clears throat> you're asking for something that's impossible. But what isn't impossible is awareness every moment, here and now. It's, you know, it's not, it's available every moment. Uh, it's not, it's not something refined and, and uh, that you have to aspire to through, through years of diligent meditation practice, but it's something to, to begin to awaken to. Like the, the word Buddha means awakened consciousness, awaken to reality. And, uh, this is the, you know, very clearly pointed out in the Buddhist teaching, uh, you know, encouraging us to, to bhati bhata, or to practice, put it into daily life practice, use it not just in, in meditation retreats, but to integrate this awareness into our daily life. This is uh, the gift that is available to us at this time. Thank you, Rupa. Um, then the question is, how is thinking an obstacle to knowing? Like thinking is an artificial function. And as I've said previously, it's a, it's, it's about the nature of sankharas. It's a sankhara itself. Thinking is a sankhara. It's a condition. It's not ultimate reality. So you can't find ultimate reality through thinking, through the intellect. You know, it's an intuitive awakening rather than an intellectual reasoned experience. Uh, so when you one who, you know, and we're modern 
life in modern societies. People are educated. This is called the information age. There's so much information easily available to to everybody at this time and creates the, you know, more thinking. And, but we're aware of thinking. You know, if you're not, you're not a thought, you're not a helpless victim of thoughts if you observe them. And I always encourage people to, because they can understand this, the observed thinking, but then they, they, they can't do it. So, you know, rather than just holding on to the idea that you should observe what you're thinking, uh, I encourage deliberate thinking so that you're, you're, you're not interested in the thoughts that you're thinking, but you're aware of thinking, I am a human being or something, something innocuous, something you're not interested in or brings no strong negative feelings or positive feelings. So it, you're not interested in the words anymore. And you're not, uh, you, you know, you, that's uh, such as a, such a banal thought as I am a human being, um, but you're interested in non-thinking where the thought ceases. So when you think I, you know, it's just one letter word and it, and it ceases immediately, but <coughs> Excuse me. There's there's still consciousness after the pronoun I has ceased, and you're aware of that. You're aware of non-thought, and then between the between the spaces between the words I and am, am and a, a and human being, and the. And the ending of human being, there's nothing, isn't it? The, the, the word itself disappears into consciousness, into a void, and there's still awareness. So you're beginning to connect with awareness that isn't uh, conceived or, or isn't... Um, filled with thoughts, with conditions, with feelings. So, you know, because this is so simple, most people overlook this kind of practice. But as you learn to think deliberately, quite intentionally think something, but you're not interested in what you're thinking, but the substratum behind the thought, so the reality of consciousness, or conscious awareness, that is always present when the word, the pronoun I has disappeared, am has disappeared, a has disappeared, human being has disappeared. There's the same knowing awareness that one recognizes, you know, that we tend to not notice that when we're just caught in the thinking process. Because thinking, you know, it depends on grammar, it's a habit pattern. When you're born, you're not born thinking. No newborn baby is thinking, doesn't have a language yet, doesn't know how to think, but is certainly aware. You know, a newborn child knows when it's hungry, when it's tired, when it's needy. It's, uh, you know, so it has, you know, the instinctual intelligence for survival and uh, expressing its needs. Without thought, it doesn't think I'm hungry, I'm tired. Um, and it's aware that hunger is, you know, the, the, when hunger comes, then, you know, it demands food. And as, you know, and as adults, where we're caught in our thinking process, we, you know, we, we think we're hungry. Uh, we might feel hunger, and then we identify with the hunger as I'm hungry. And that's a thought, you know, I am the hunger that I'm feeling. Where in awareness, you know, hunger is like this, you know, so you're looking at it not as a, a giving it a personal uh, 
quality, but seeing it as impersonal, it is what it is. You know, so when the body's hungry, it's like this. And you, your relationship to the experiences of fatigue, of hunger, of, of boredom, of fear and anxiety, you know, are beginning to, you're seeing through them. You're, you're not trying to destroy them or annihilate them, but you're no longer kind of deluded by them. So I encourage people to not believe their thoughts because ultimately, you know, if, you know, the here and now is perfect. But your Banna Dhamma, here and now, the deathless reality of here and now, timelessness. So perfection is here and now where where um, when we forget that, when we get caught in memories of the past or you know, images of the future, we, we forget perfection. We become lost in our own fears and desires, our own habits, our own emotional habits, thinking habits, uh, our concepts, our views, our opinions. And then we get lost in and, you know, we can spend much of our life caught in anxiety about the future or guilt or regret about the past, when every moment of every human being's life is perfect in itself. So it's, you know, so try to imagine that. You can't image images, there's no image for that. It's an intuitive awakening reality that we encourage you to experiment, to try it out, to begin to, to you know, not believe everything your critical mind says uh, about what you should or shouldn't be, or how life should be or shouldn't be, or, you know, carrying grudges, carrying uh, resentments uh, about things done in the past is, is suffering in the present. You know, so you're, you're, you're thinking about some unfair experience, some unwanted uh, abuse you've experienced in the past, in the present. So you're not aware of the perfection of here and now. You know, completely oblivious to it, even though it is here and now. So it's, it, you know, so bhavana or meditation in this sense is, is learning to no longer grasp imagination, grasp memory out of ignorance, but to reflect that they, they arise and cease, they come and go. So we're not trying to get rid of them, but we're no longer uh, enslaved or deluded by them, by memories of the past or our hopes or fears for the future.